Tastemakers was funded in part by... It all comes down to creating something unique. It's important to take pride in one's work and share expertise. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. And by Fleischmann's Yeast. And A.B. Mowry. Today we are in Vero Beach, Florida, the Indian River Lagoon specifically, to meet Alden and Val Bing, the husband and wife team behind Orchid Island Brewery. They specialize in creating sours and IPAs that highlight this region's incredible citrus, and the fog behind me is going to play a really interesting role in this episode. So come along with me as we take a sip of citrus-infused beers that will transport you straight to Florida. I'm Kat Neville, and I've been telling the story of local food for about 20 years. In that time, I've seen the American food movement explode in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. Here in Vero, it is sun, sand, and citrus. This is a community that retains a bit of old Florida charm, and it is bisected by the Indian River Lagoon, which spans 156 miles and 30% of the Florida coastline. Today, we're going to meet Alden and Val Bing of Orchid Island Brewing. They also straddle the state's past and present by crafting modern beers with a respect for Florida's agricultural past. The street that I grew up on backed up to a citrus grove, and one of my favorite joys in life was climbing trees. And my aspiration from very early on was to be a fruit picker, because I love citrus and I love climbing trees. So the brewery has, in a sense, enabled me to, to follow that aspiration. originally and we were brewing one day and uh, Val had the idea to incorporate some grapefruit growing in the yard into the beer. In our own backyard we had our own citrus trees there that we were able to go out and pick and using that citrus in the beer it just creates and evolves such wonderful flavors. We had this idea why don't we start this brewery we opened the doors in August of 2014, and here we are going on our fourth anniversary. to have a lot of fun and at our size we get to do a lot of progressive things. Brandon is our right hand person at the brewery and he works well with Val and I. We'll draw inspiration from one another between soundboarding it between us we'll, we'll be able to take it somewhere that one of us couldn't have ever considered. The spectrum of beer styles is very large. The reality is, is that there is dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of different beer styles out there. 
the three that we focus mostly on, number one is IPA, number two, Russian Imperial Stouts, and our sour beers. Sour beers have recently seen a huge increase in popularity, and I think for very good reason. These tart beers have a wonderful backbone that stands up to and enhances all kinds of food, plus they're super cool. They're made with really interesting kinds of bacteria and yeast. Sours, they represent a style that really go to the core of the genesis and origins of beer. Before we had microscopes, it was considered a mysterious and magical the way that beer transformed from a sweet liquid into beer. What they later learned was that yeast and microflora were floating through the air and inoculating the beer in these open vats, and they would barrel age these beers. In beers that we barrel age, the wild yeast strains will form residency almost in these barrels, so we'll continue to recycle these barrels. The beer will evolve over time, and we'll blend the beers together from different barrels. When did you start aging your beer in barrels? So we started at home brewing, and we aged our beers for some of our first wild beers that we made. And what does aging do for a beer? Because a lot of beer you want to drink right away and drink it fresh. It just depends on the style of beer that you're approaching. For IPAs, you want to make very fresh beer and consume it very fresh. With other beers, like uh, Lambics and Sours, you can age them anywhere from two months all the way to three, four, five years. For some wow, beers. really? Yep. And so how long have these been in the barrel? These have been aging for one year, six months. The style of beer that we're working with will determine at what points in time that we include citrus into the beer. In the case of these barrel-aged beers, we'll add a citrus zest, in some cases citrus juice, at the very end of secondary fermentation. We'll leave it with barrels for at least a month to two months, and the yeast have this really magical way of incorporating the citrus into the beer, and it becomes part of the beer. It's exciting that you've been able to capture and harness what it is that each strain of yeast is able to add to the beers that you're trying to make. Yeah, so in a sense, you're wrangling the yeast the same as you would cattle. Brewers, they are more of janitors or, or maintaining clean environments. It really is the yeast who are the brewers, the ones making the beer. Alden focuses on sourcing his ingredients as close to home as possible, and because beer is 80% water, his water comes from a very surprising source. So when we first started home brewing, we were using local municipality water, and our beers were not coming out the way that we wanted them to. After doing a lot of studying, we figured out that it was the water that we needed to adjust. That caused us to start buying distilled water, and we built our water back according to the style of beer that we were approaching. Once we moved into a commercial scale, that quickly became not economical we needed to solve for it. And the technology that we found was these basically glorified dehumidifiers that pull the water from the air. So remember when I was standing on the beach at the very beginning of this episode and I mentioned all the fog behind me? Well, this is why it's so important. Alden, you actually condense the humidity out of the air here in Florida to make the base water for your beer. Yeah. It's a pretty radical concept, but we got inspired when we learned about this technology. It comes out of Australia where they have groundwater issues. And for us, a lot of the process is staying as local as possible. Water is the ingredient that makes up most of the beer. So when we thought to ourselves that, hey, maybe we could actually make beer with the air that we're breathing, it just kind of blew our minds. And so this is the, uh, this is the way that we source for water. So how does it work? They're basically glorified dehumidifiers. So the same air that we're breathing right now has humidity. It literally pulls air through it. There's condensers on the backside, 
and it captures the water and then goes into a reservoir and then gets pumped into this holding tank where we pull from to make the beer. When you pull it in, you actually do modify it. So tell me how you get it to certain flavor profiles, because water really does have a flavor to it. Sure. We just made a uh, Radler beer, which is a German beer, and we found out what the mineral content was of Munich, Germany, and then we replicated Munich water. It's a very, very soft, soft water, and that's why beers out of Germany are very clean and, and crisp. One of my favorite aspects of the Orchid Island Brewery story is Alden's deep ties to the local citrus industry. Indian River County is known for growing some of the best citrus in the entire world, and the Indian River Lagoon is one of the reasons why. The best way to experience just how special and unique the Indian River Lagoon ecosystem is is to get up close and personal, so we're taking a tour. being on the water. This is an intercoastal waterway that you're in right now. There's so much history out here. We don't have an inlet here. Closest inlet is 15 miles south. It gives us a buffer for the bad water. And that's why Indian River's got some of the most pristine water on the east coast of Florida. The manatees are strictly vegetarians. We have 2,100 species of plant life in this lagoon, so they are thriving on that vegetation. These are spoil islands. There's 136 of them in Indian River Lagoon. I tell you, in many ways, these birds are very important to the ecosystem out here and to these islands. citrus is so prominent, or was, and they would load them on the boats all up and down the lagoon area. They've worked awful hard to go through droughts and blight and restart all the way over sometimes, you know? So there's a lot of pride and a lot of hard work and sweat's what made Florida. We chose to have our brewery on Orchid Island itself, not only for the natural butterfly orchids that grow here, but because of the local citrus that once used to grow here. Years ago, back in the 1950s, this area just north of where we are right now had citrus groves growing. It is a little bit on the sad side because there was a lot of housing development that came through and did take up that piece of land that did once have these beautiful citrus trees on it. The lasting legacy here in this area is citrus. And when we lose citrus area to homes or illness uh, affecting citrus now called greening, a part of the legacy and a part of the sense of place goes away and it's been a pursuit of ours to help maintain that legacy and hopefully enhance it. So I'm standing here in the middle of the most fragrant citrus grove with Lewis Schacht. And it looks like summer here, but really it is 
the middle of February, and that is peak season for most citrus. February is National Grapefruit Month, so it's peak season for grapefruit, and it's really the heart of our harvest season here. So explain to me the geography of Indian River County and specifically right here and what impact the lagoon has on the quality of the citrus. Sure, this is part of the Indian River Growing District and that's defined as being 20 miles off the lagoon from Daytona Beach to West Palm Beach. And it's a unique growing area mainly because of the limestone rich soil. If you head to the interior of Florida, you get a little bit more elevation, you lose that uh, feature. You also lose the sea breeze, which is important to it also but this is kind of world-renowned area for growing the best citrus in the world, which means the highest sugar content, and it's also been well-known for years as the best grapefruit district in the world. We harvest November through April. We pick basically every day that it's not raining in season. Wow. And so when it goes to the processing house, the packing house, it goes through a washer? Right, we wash it. Basically from there, it's just a sorting process for quality. It's a sorting process for size. your history with Alden. Alden actually was a really good friend of his brother's growing up, so I knew Alden quite well. Always a fun-loving guy, and I saw his dad, this has probably been 10 years ago, came in the shop and he said, well, Alden's starting a brewery. I said, well, wow. And come to find out Alden, you know, wanted to do something with a great respect for the local agricultural community and citrus especially, and I had no idea, quite frankly, that there was such a citrus movement within beer Alden really had a talent for it and really um, put it together and had a vision and a mission. That he'll come out and source his fruit through us and we end up being able to say that, you know, we're kind of in the beer business even though we're not. But <laughs> um, it works out real well. And so when he comes to your packing house right. to pick up a citrus, he's actually taking fruit that would not be sold to the typical consumer. Right, he's looking for external quality and not necessarily internal quality. So something that has a good external peel is what he's looking for. He's looking to zest it. The same thing with any other perishable product. The citrus is meant to be consumed fresh, and we incorporate it into our beers very fresh. Um, and with that comes along this very inefficient responsibility of processing the fruit, zesting it, and juicing it. So Val is going to teach me how to zest these oranges and grapefruits. This is a potato peeler. Originally, you were zesting by hand with a vegetable peeler? We were, yes. And it took us about four hours just to do a batch. And so we were able to find the potato peelers. And now it's cut down into about half. I'm trying to find the flat part of okay. the orange. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to stick it right into the spikes. Okay. And then this part here is actually the peeler part. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to get that close to the top. And then this spike here, you want to bring that down. And that just secures your orange. Oh, I see. Yep. All right. Okay. And then there's a little red button right here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> This is like really meditative and it smells yes. amazing in this courtyard. The location could not be more beautiful. I mean, we're surrounded oh, by sunshine smell. and blue skies and the smell of citrus. I mean, this is the essence of Florida. Right around the corner from Orchid Island Brewery is the Vero Beach Farmer's Market, where farmers and makers set up every Saturday. So what is your relationship with Alden and Val and the Orchid Island Brewery? Well, Alden asked me if I'd be interested in the beer mash, uh, spent beer mash for my cattle. And I tried it, and the cows at first were hesitant, but now it's when they see me drive up, they can literally smell it, and they just they rush to the truck and come to get it. You know, as fast as I can dump it out, they eat it. 
you have this symbiotic relationship with Alden where he supplies feed for your cattle and yes. you're supplying beef to his yeah. restaurant. Yes, he's providing me with something that provides him with something that helps his business, that helps my business. Doyle is somebody that I have a whole lot of regard to. After we brew, we take our spent grain to Doyle's farm and he feeds it to his cattle. It turns out that it's actually very good for cattle. Relationships with local farmers is the heart and soul of what makes us who we are. Between Lewis and Doyle and Val and I, we've created this circular symbiotic form of a relationship. There's a, a beauty in that system and, and that it's local and that it's fresh and then that we are dependent on one another. To go down to our local farmer's market and to be able to see them there and to interact with them and to know what they're doing with their passion and their businesses. And it's a wonderful friendship circle that we have created here in town. So we have a craft beer festival today to attend just right here in Vero Beach. It is a wonderful experience where we actually get to have our product with us today, but it's not selling for a profit. It's handing out for sampling, and I enjoy so much seeing the uh, customers, you know, just the way that they enjoy it and they taste it for the first time. Our goal with the brewery has always been to really educate our community and educate them through the citrus as well as the craft beer scene. feel this brewery embodies is that connection that the food movement really is seeking to have between different people throughout the community. And you're creating a product that people can sit and enjoy, and they can only have it here. I mean, it's, there's such a sense of place, all the way from the name to what is truly in the glass. We've become very passionate about our provenance and our provenance here is citrus. And we've discovered ways to incorporate the sense of place and people into beer. episode here in Vero Beach doing a cooking demo with local pompano. We're going to grill that over some grapefruit wood that you got from Lewis. Beer obviously is delicious to drink, but you can also cook with it. And so I'm going to show you how to make a really quick, very simple marinade. And then we're going to make a salsa with the grapefruit. We're going to drink this one. I'm going to pour this one into a bowl. This is the Star Ruby that you saw made earlier in this episode. That beautiful citrus-infused IPA. So it's gonna have not only a citrus flavor, but a lot of kind of bitter hoppiness to it. So I'm gonna balance that out with a little bit of fresh lime juice and some garlic and some salt and some pepper. Weren't you in banking before this? Yeah, coming out of school, banking was my first profession. I bet you couldn't be happier that you quit your day job. <laughs> yeah, it didn't set my skirt on fire quite like making beer does. <laughs> so fish and salsa, obviously to me, that means fish tacos. So we are gonna serve this with some avocado, some crema, and some grilled corn. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these on the fire. And I'm just gonna quickly chop up half of an onion, some minced garlic, some salt and some pepper and some sugar, then some jalapeno. I'm gonna pull the corn off. It's nice and charred exactly the way that I want it. Then Alden, I think you're gonna throw that pompano on the grill, aren't you? Ready. All right. So I have a few tortillas just warming on the grill. The last step is just to slice up an avocado. So we have our corn, our corn tortillas, 
avocado, our crema, this beautiful pompano that has been marinated, of course, in that star ruby. And then right over the top, we're gonna spoon this fresh salsa that really makes the most of Indian River citrus and the flavors that you grew up with here in Vero Beach. Nothing better than grilling fish by the beach and drinking beer. Cheers. Cheers. I'll see you next time. There's more information on the makers featured in this series along with recipes and extra videos at wearetastemakers.com. Tastemakers was funded in part by It all comes down to creating something unique. It's important to take pride in one's work and share expertise. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. and by Fleischmann's Yeast, and A.B. Mowry.